I want to preach to you for a little while this morning. Uh, would you stand with me for the reading of one verse of Scripture in Jude? There's only one chapter in the book of Jude, and so it's Jude verse 11. And I want you to um, see it on the screen, and then you can read over it real quick while I'm talking, and then I want you to read it with me in just a few seconds. Um, this verse speaks of three people and the problem that they had. So let's read it together. Woe unto them. Would you read it out loud with me? Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands. Let's ask God to touch us in the next few minutes this morning. God, on this August Sunday morning, we ask that the Holy Ghost would move into this building and talk to us in the next few minutes. Lord God, we don't have to have anything spectacular other than your presence. And I pray that you would move in this place and touch us in the next few minutes in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Uh, let's look at this verse again. Um, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So you have three things here. The way of Cain, you have hatred. The heir of Balaam, you have greed. The gainsaying of Korah, you have rebellion. And so these are three key words that categorize this group of people that Jude is talking about that is filled with hatred and greed and rebellion. Time does not permit nor inclination today to talk about all three of these, but I do want to take a little bit of time and talk about Cain. If you um, would read with me in Genesis chapter 4, I want to read this passage of Scripture, and I hope that you will follow with us beginning at verse 3, and this is what it says. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. My uh, sister died this week on uh, Tuesday morning, and it made me think again of many of the things that I'm going to uh, preach to you today. She was 69 years old. Um, she was healthy in every way except she had a little weak respiratory system but had uh, been in and out of the hospital with it through the years and always they cleared it up. And um, this time it looked like all the other times 
but it didn't end up that way, and she died. Uh, I tried to get there before she died. Uh, we were up all night Tuesday night and then flew all night Monday night and then flew there to Las Vegas Tuesday and then drove for two and a half hours uh, very, very fast. But while we were driving, her daughter, her granddaughter called and said, you're too late. So it made me think about a lot of things, and uh, it made me think about some things that I want to share with you this morning. My sister did it her way. She did it her way. And um, <clears throat> there are a lot of people that feel like they can do it their way, and they do it uh, not recognizing the consequences of doing it their way. So what I'm going to preach to you today is coming out of about 45 years of personal ministry and also watching a girl grow from a rebellious teenager to a 69-year-old woman who... Uh, finally gasps her last breath and passes from this world. This would have been her mantra. She would have, uh, she was a strong, intelligent, defiant person, and this would have been her mantra. You all have heard the poem Invictus, Invictus written by William Ernest Henley. Invictus means unconquered. And you have heard this poem. If we have it, we can put it on the screen. Uh, this was written by this man that overcome a lot of adversity in his life. And he said, Out of the night that covers me black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This poem has been read many times. This poem describes the defiant attitude of my sister. Uh, she, would, she would not allow herself to be afraid of anything or unconquered by anything. And I want to talk about that a little bit in just a moment. Uh, this poem that I read to you, Invictus, has uh, been quoted many, many times. We could spend a lot of time on this poem. It is the place that the phrase came, that we're bloody but unbowed. This is where this all originally came from. And uh, this, uh, you all remember the notorious... Lee, um, infamous Timothy McVeigh that, that bombed the building in Oklahoma and killed scores of people and babies and so forth. When Timothy McVeigh was going to die for his crimes, the last thing he did was quote this poem. Um, and <clears throat> He also was a man that defied death, defied everything, defied authority, defied God, defied everybody, didn't matter what anybody said. He was a man who had the anti-social dream of an undefined ideal which makes people do terrible things uh, and destructive things. 
he was a man, some of this won't mean any to some of you, but he was a man who read Atlas Shrugged at least six times and uh, was possessed with being the master of his fate and uh, being the captain of his soul. And after killing all those people, he was uh, remorseless and did not uh, give any kind of pity to anybody. And Timothy McVeigh died that way. Uh, my sister, of course, didn't do any of those things, but when she was dying, she told her grandkids, don't call any of my family. I don't want them to know till after I'm dead. Cremate my body. I don't want no funeral. I don't want no uh, memorial service. Just get it over with. So with all that in mind, I want to talk about this a little bit this morning because you and I are caught in this web of life and all of us are going to um, have an attitude about life one way or another that is going to take us to victory or is going to take us to a life of bitterness and defeat. So I'm going to preach to you in just a moment. It's a little early today, so uh, if you got to go, go. But we're, we're going to uh, preach to you. First, we have another special. I have a special song for you today. I'm not going to sing it, but I got a guy here that's going to sing it. In fact, I got two guys, Frank Sinatra and Pavarotti, are going to sing. I did it my way. You look at the words on the screen and study them closely while Mr. Sinatra sings. What is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. So I want to preach to you a little bit today about I did it my way. Frank Sinatra, um, June Kyle, my sister, and Kane are all in the same group. And Timothy McVeigh, even though they were not murderers on the same scale, Kane was a murderer. But they are people who did it their way. I'm probably preaching to some people today. I know there are people who come to this church that say, I will do it my way. So give me just a couple of minutes today to talk to you about this. When you leave, I want you to be thinking about yourself and about your future. And frankly, I don't want your blood on my hands. So I will try to preach to you the truth. I read to you from Genesis chapter 4, which is about Cain and Abel, and most all of you have heard the story repeatedly. I don't need to repeat the whole story today. But when you read your Bible, one of the things that you discover is that the earliest Bible stories are also, in most cases, the leanest, the most economically written Bible stories. This is especially true in the book of Genesis. Um, you also know, if you've come to church very long, that there is what's called a rule of interpreting the Bible that is called the rule of first mention. And what is remarkably true about that is that when something is first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Genesis, it invariably carries the same meaning throughout the Bible all the way, even though it's written over a span of 3,500 years, when it was first mentioned in the early parts of Genesis, it carries the same, it's called the rule of first mention, that when it's first mentioned, every time you see that later in the Bible, you can hook it back to first mention. You also see in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there are not many names from the Old Testament that are carried over into the New Testament. I mean, in passing, some of the heroes are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, and some of the heroes are mentioned in other places in the preaching of Stephen or even in the preaching and teaching of Jesus. But overall, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names in the Old Testament. 
and only a few of them mentioned in the New Testament. And out of that few, there are even a fewer still that are what we call representative people. They are people that are larger than life. They are people that represent a whole mindset, a whole idea, a whole uh, set of things comes to mind when you say their name. This is true, as we wrote in Bonds of Love about Sarah, the beautiful, beautiful wife of Abraham. She is, she is in the Bible presented in words that we would use today as stunning. She was startlingly beautiful. And then it tells us that she represents a certain kind of beauty in the world uh, of, of appearance and of beauty of character uh, of a woman. And then in contrast to her uh, is Jezebel, who's also a representative woman. Mentioned in the Old Testament, but carried over into the New Testament. And of all places, mentioned in the book of Revelation as uh, a woman who had an, an outside appearance of beauty, but was in fact a seductress and inside was full of rottenness and full of bitterness and full of sin. And she is a contrast. She's juxtaposed with Sarah in the Bible as a contrast of two ways that women uh, attempt to find beauty. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, Sarah is the way that is authentic beauty, and the other one is a way that is artificial beauty. But they are representative people. Of course, Moses is a representative person, and we could name a number of others that are representative people. One of those that is a representative person out of the Old Testament is this man, Cain. In fact, both Cain and Abel, the um, third and fourth human beings to ever live on the earth, are both representative people. In fact, when you get back this far, both their mother, Eve, and their father, Adam, as well as these two brothers, Cain and Abel, all four of them are representative people. And all four of them are also mentioned in the New Testament. And there's certain things about humanity, certain things about people and about the way they go and the direction they take. All that comes out of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, this first family of a father and a mother and of these two brothers, Cain and Abel. You know the story how that Abel was a keeper of sheep, the Bible says, and that um, uh, Cain was a tiller of the ground. And when you look and see this, you see that there is uh, a little irony involved in that. That Abel is a keeper of sheep, the Bible says, and sheep produce wool. And wool is the basic fabric from which cloth has been made for thousands of years, especially in the Old Testament because they had sheep. Wool is a primary fabric that is used repeatedly with many applications. Uh, we also know that, that he being a keeper of the sheep leads us back to think because these stories don't have many details. So what details they do have take on uh, exceptional significance for you and I. And so when we think of a keeper of the sheep, we think of animals and we think of God covering Adam and Eve, how that he covered them. And he covered them with the skins of animals. And we all know that there are certain deductions that we arrive at as a result of that. Uh, they knew that they were naked. They were without a covering. And as a consequence, God uh, provides them with the covering of animal skins, which leads to the logical conclusion that the animal skins were gotten from animals that were slain, which is the shedding of blood, which is the simple metaphoric way in which God is showing us early in the Old Testament that man's nakedness before God and man's judgment of being stripped of the glory can only be covered by the shedding of blood. And by the shedding of blood, something has to be slain. Uh, a lamb, if you please, is slain. When you look in the old Bible, you will see in the Old Testament that uh, there was a lamb that was slain uh, here uh, and with Abraham, a lamb that was slain for one man. 
And then you find with the nation of Israel a lamb that was slain for a family and they put the blood on the doorpost of the house when they were coming out of Egypt that the family would not experience uh, the death angel visiting their house and the firstborn being killed. And then you find on the day of atonement as a nation that God gave them once a year a lamb that the high priest would slay and take the blood into the Holy of Holies and apply it in various places in various ways. There was a systematic way of doing that. And that that lamb was slain and it would, it would take away the sins of the nation, take the judgment off of them for another year until the next day of atonement in the following year. And so there was a lamb for an individual and a lamb for a family and a lamb for a nation. And then, and then when John the Baptist announces the coming of Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And so all of this stems out of this story that God uh, took animals and slew them and, uh, and out of that took the skins of those animals and out of that product uh, a fabric is created. And it is not, <clears throat> I think, an accident that Abel is a keeper of sheep and that he is a keeper of that from which the fabric of covering is made. Uh, it indicates the obedience of Adam and Eve in that without animals and without the shedding of the blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins and obedience to God in, in, in becoming covered, uh, to cover up our nakedness by what God has provided for us. Uh, is a key component. I know that what I'm saying so far this morning is uh, relatively simple, but I want you to understand that this early story of Abel, the keeper of sheep, leads back. The fact he's a keeper of sheep connects back to the fact that it was the skin of animals that were slain. Perhaps it was sheep that was slain. Personally, I think it probably was because it keeps the type all the way till Jesus comes. Uh, that, 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 that sheep were slain and God took those skins and made, uh, uh, uh lamb skin, if you please, uh, clothing for, uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, and then, and then Abel, understanding that, becomes a keeper of sheep and, uh, and they have submitted to God's will. And Cain and Abel had to know all of that. Cain and Abel, there's no doubt in my mind, understood fully what it meant to be clothed and fully what it meant for uh, there to be the shedding of animals and the shedding of, the, of blood and the taking of their life. And clearly that the, that the shedding of blood was essential for a person to find uh, rightness with God and peace with God. This is why you have to have Jesus Christ in your life, because it's His blood that's shed for our sins. Without Jesus Christ in your life, there is no forgiveness of sins. It's not a matter of works. It's not a matter of being a good guy. It's not a matter of helping old ladies across the street. It's not a matter of being a good boy scout. Uh, it's not a matter of being a good husband. It's a matter of do you have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life and have you repented of your sins and let him wash you clean. That's the issue. There's nothing else going to take the place of that. And there is a resistance to that in our human nature. There is a rebellion to that in our human nature. You have to break that down. You have to, you have to be obedient the way Adam and Eve were. You have to submit to the will of God and in submission you come to Him and you find Him. Can you say amen? Amen. And so Abel is a keeper of sheep. On the other hand, Cain is a grower of fruit. The Bible actually uses that word, fruit. It's probably more than ironic. I haven't never read this in any commentaries, but I believe that it's clear, clearly biblical. That Adam as a keeper of sheep, that Abel as a keeper of sheep represents the path to salvation is through the covering and the slaying and the, and the spilling of the blood. Cain, on the other hand, is a grower of fruit. As a grower of fruit, it is ironic, perhaps circumstantial, perhaps not, that it is fruit that caused Adam and Eve to sin. And that they partook of a fruit 
And Cain is a fruit grower. And Cain is a man who every time he reaps a crop is thinking about the fruit. And Adam and Eve, every time they see fruit, is thinking not of obedience, but of rebellion. And the rebellion of Adam and Eve is seen in the fruit gathering and partaking. And when you look at this, you will see, if you remember the story of Adam and Eve, they took the fruit based on human logic instead of revelation. The devil said, Has not half God said, Ye shall not eat thereof? And he, he logically said, You're going to learn more. You're going to be smarter. He appealed to the human ego. You're going to be like God. You will not have to bow to anybody. You will be like God himself. You can determine your own fate. You can be the master of your fate. You can be the captain of your soul because you will have knowledge like God has if you eat of the fruit. And Cain is a grower of fruit. And when it comes time for Cain and Abel to bring their offerings, Abel, in obedience to the pattern set by his parents, slays the lamb and brings the blood offering to God. And Cain, in the pattern set by his parents in their rebellion, picks the fruit and in defiance to God's revealed will, brings the fruit to God. Because according to his logic, that's what he grew, and that's what he chose to bring. And what God has said is not too important, because this is what I think ought to be done. And this is how I feel like it ought to be done. And I want to bring you my achievement. And I think that it is not an accident that the fruit that Cain brings ties to the fruit that his parents ate, and that the fruit offering represents rejection of God's way for providing salvation. And it, it indicates God's provision for salvation is something that Cain decides he doesn't have to have, that he's going to do it his way. And so now we see two columns that are started, the Cain column and the Abel column. When we look at Cain, we see that his offering is rejected and he becomes an angry man. And so while I'm thinking today of the patterns of life that are established when people early on are confronted by God and the things of God and the ways of God, when I think of that, I am thinking about how early on this man set a pattern of angry living and set a pattern of being an angry person, someone that's always shrill, someone that's always angry, someone that's always accusative. Beware, somewhere they have started a pattern in their life that is going to bear no good fruit but it's going to grow into a bitterness that is a horrible, horrible thing to behold. I'm going to preach to you for a little while today, and I hope you never forget what I'm preaching. And so Cain becomes an angry man, and in his anger, when you look at the source of his anger, the source of his anger is self-will that has been thwarted. It is self-will that has been thwarted. And as a result of it being thwarted, he either has to become obedient and adjust his attitude and adjust his self-will to follow the ways of obedience and of God, or else he will become resistant and unwilling to relinquish his self-will. And when that happens, the message of obedience 
It undoubtedly came through the human instrumentality of his parents. He knew that it was appointed by God that his parents were, if you please, the authority in his life. And there is not a shadow of a doubt in my mind that Adam and Eve was saved, that Adam and Eve was covered with the skins, and that Adam and Eve taught their children the way to sacrifice. But it was a matter of choice on Cain's part to stay with the fruit bearing. It was the side of Abel to stay with obedience. And I might just say here, in Cain's defense, although there won't be much of that, that Cain, I believe the scripture using what it uses, indicates that Cain got his idea that fruit was the way instead of blood from observing his parents' disobedience, the story that they told back to them of what had happened that they obviously knew because you and I are thousands of years later and we know it. So it's obvious that their kids knew it. That the story that they knew, that it pointed back. And so a chain of rebellion is set up. A chain of self-will is established. A chain of resistance to the things of God. Oh yes, Adam and Eve straightened out and thank God Abel got the message. But somewhere along the way, Cain didn't get the message. Uh, Cain got the earlier message about disobedience and about fruit eating and about don't worry about blood. And somewhere it marked him along the way. I remember pastoring years ago um, when I was about, uh, I was still in my 20s. And while I was pastoring, there was a family of, of, uh, of three children. And when I got there, two of them were teenagers and one of them was in the early 20s. And uh, one day I said to the mother, I said, we're going to get your two younger children. We need to really pray for your older child because they're already older when we've come into contact with them. And they're already got some ways set that, that I don't have anything to do with and that sister wasn't have anything to do with. And, and we, we can't recall that. And I will never forget that mother's, huh, she lost her breath for a moment. She said, oh, Brother Wilson, don't, don't say that. Don't say that, Brother Wilson. We, we've got to say, and when I saw how deeply it struck her, I said, no, we're going to work. We're going to try. We're going to work on it. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to prepare you for the fact that there's more challenges there. And that was years ago. And time has proven that it was the case. And, and thank God eventually all three of them did get in the church and are in the church. But, but, but that oldest one had already got patterns that were set from his daddy before I ever got there that those patterns have never been totally eradicated and he wanders around and he doesn't have direction in his life and now he's an old man. And, but the two younger ones got it because they were still young enough. Oh, I cannot emphasize to you enough today. The old mantra that what parents do has so much to do with their children. When they go on vacation and sit in their rooms and watch their movies. When they wear their clothes they shouldn't wear. When they do things that they shouldn't do. All of those things that take place somewhere along the line. Nothing is said but it all clicks in the kids and clicks in them until they are caught betwixt and between of not knowing. And like the young lady that came and, and crying said to a couple of our young people and, and and, 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 and to, I think it was Rebecca, said, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what my mom and dad believes because one day they're over here saying these people are all right and the next day they're in our church and they're preaching the truth. She said, I don't know. And if I can tell you today, oh, the, 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 it's unspeakable, the tragedy of that child's life. All of it started somewhere, 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 because a parent did not realize the impact of what they were doing and how it was going to affect that child. And so Cain picks up the wrong part of mom and dad's example. And Abel picks up the right part. And Cain becomes an angry man. And, and his resistance to Abel and to God brought anger to him. 
And he was an angry man. Angry at everything. I'm sure angry at his mom and dad. Angry at his brother. Angry at God. An angry man. I wrote a letter to a young man this morning before church that I will send this week talking about being an angry man. Angry at God. Angry at everything. And that anger brought a mindset. And that mindset brought a seriously flawed logic. And the seriously flawed logic brought rash actions. In this case, murder. And that created situations from which he apparently never extricated himself. I got to tell you, Adam and Eve's sin, but Cain's sin was different than Eve's or Adam's. Eve was deceived. Eve was seduced. Eve was gullible. In today's vernacular, which is not true because hair color doesn't make any difference, but Eve was a blonde. Really, hair doesn't make much color. And if blonde was something bad, you wouldn't have so many center women dyeing their hair blonde. Eve was ignorant. Didn't justify her sin, but it put it in a different category, a different degree, a different level. Adam was not deceived, but Adam's sin was not based on greed. Adam's sin, if we look at Jesus, was based on his love for another. So Adam sinned for Eve's sake. And there's a parallel there between Jesus. Like Jesus, Adam left his paradise to gain his bride. Adam became a sinner, and the Bible says Jesus became sin for us. Adam went out into the world of sin trying to keep his wife, and he could not get her back to God. But unlike Adam... The last Adam brought us back to paradise. He went and rescued us and brought us back. Can you say praise the Lord? So Eve sinned because she was deceived. Adam sinned because of his love for another. But Cain sinned because of the love of himself. And this self-love put him in a different category. Cain said, if you want me, God, you will take me on my terms, not on your terms. No matter what the word says, God, I will interpret it my way. Doesn't matter what Adam and Eve said or the authority you put in my life. It doesn't matter. And no matter what I've been taught, I will advocate for my way. There are people here today, there are people that come to this church that have that spirit on them. And they're heading for such a dead end. I'm not browbeating you today. I'm not berating you today. I'm trying, I'm trying to reach you today and tell you that the, that the fractious, irritable, angry, self-willed, defiant, I'll do it my way, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, I am unconquerable, I don't want anybody, I don't need anybody, and even if I know I'm heading towards self-destruction, I am so deep into my isolation and rebellion that I'll go to hell before I'll let anybody break in to the cocoon that I put around myself. 
and some of you are going. And so there is a progression. I jotted it down this morning. There is self-will that leads to rebellion. And rebellion leads to rejection by God. Cain is rejected. And rejection of your way leads to anger. And anger leads to an exposure to a deep, dark world of evil forces that are from ancient times that are masters of bondage and that suck people into that until they are so bound that they cannot find their way out. And the Bible is telling us something when it says, And Cain was very wroth. And the very next line, God says, Why are you angry? Why has thy countenance fallen? And the very next verse, God says, Sin lieth at the door. Sin, the Hebrew original is that by becoming an angry man, self-willed and resistant, you have come to a place that is very close to sin. Exact Hebrew. Crouching at the door like a waiting lion to pounce. Your anger, Cain, has moved you very, very close to the crouching enemy that is a roaring lion and that will rend you. Before, the lion was always there, but you were a long ways from it. But now, your self-will has led you to anger. Your rejection has made you wroth. And now, sin is coming perilously close to consuming you and taking you into an area from which you will never return. Get it? Self-will led to rebellion. Rebellion led to rejection by God. Rejection led to anger. Anger led to exposure to deep and evil forces. That exposure led to hatred. Those forces worked in him after his rejection. His anger smoldered like a kettle bubbling a poison stew, the toxic fumes of which pervaded his entire being until anger is transposed through the help of evil forces into hatred. And hatred, he is obsessed with the wrongness of others. He is critical of God. He is critical of Adam. He is critical of Eve. He is critical of Abel. He is critical of everything. He is now obsessed with the wrongdoing or the wrongness of others until finally his hatred explodes in a brilliant light burst of a fit of insanity and he brings the club down on his brother's head and his anger that is transposed into hatred is now transposed into murder and it's in the field now it's quiet nothing can be heard except the gurgle of the blood as it runs out on the ground and the chirping of the birds and there is nothing else and Cain stands there and here's something that he has never heard in his life. He hears the voice of God saying, Where is your brother Abel? Why art thou wroth? Where is your brother Abel? And now he's got in so deep that he can't get out. 
and it becomes incumbent upon him to deflect the truth about himself. God's giving him a chance. The question is not accusative, it's merciful. Cain, where is your brother Abel? The logical conclusion to that from God's perspective is, if you will confess what you did, if you will tell me what you did, God can forgive murder. God can forgive anything. Sin is now getting ready to leap off of the porch into the air, Cain. What will be your response to the question, where is your brother Abel? And he fails the test. And he says, I know not. And there's an invisible line that people cross. I can't tell you when a person crosses it, but I've seen them cross it. And when they cross that line, the lion leaps. He pounces. And from that point forward, the description of Cain is no longer just a tiller of the ground. It is no longer just a son of Adam and Eve. But the, but the description changes to being a vagabond and a fugitive. A fugitive meaning one who is running from those who are trying to catch him. And so Cain is running. He is running and the lion is loping behind him, reaching out and taking another rip throughout the rest of his life because he has become subjected to that and he becomes a spiritual wanderer and from that point forward there is a point somewhere from that point forward I can't tell you where the point is I know people I thought had already crossed the line that have made it back somehow I thank God I'm thinking of them right now I, I, I know some that did make it back uh, but there is a line that, that others they never get back there is some kind of line that is crossed where a person becomes a spiritual wanderer and somehow they go to their grave without anything of mercy or grace or love or submission or obedience uh, ever bringing them down again and some of them go for years and decades in their defiance it's a hard life It's so hard that Cain says, it's more than I can bear. It's not fair. I've been done wrong. He's experiencing the consequences to ever deeper exposure to sin. And the consequences get heavier, heavier. And his resistance gets stronger. Till after a while, Cain is the story of a downward spiral so powerful that it reaches across the span of the Old Testament into the New Testament, leaps off of the pages, and springs into this August Sunday morning in this sanctuary. The downward spiral was so powerful. There is a verse that Frank didn't sing in the song that we had a copy of. I've loved, I've laughed and cried. I've had my feel, my share of losing. And now as tears subside, I find it all so amusing to think I did all that. And may I say, not in a shy way, oh no, oh no, not me. I did it my way. For what is a man and what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. You know, I'm just preaching this morning. I'm just, whatever happens, happens. I'm not on any crusade. I'm just preaching this morning. But if I had kids, and I loved them, I'd make sure I never missed another service. I'd make sure that I never did anything anywhere that compromised or opened the door for the possibility of the enemy getting into my home or getting into their hearts. 
There wouldn't be anything. I would be vigilant about it. I would say, "Uh -uh. uh-uh. I'm going to tell you something that we don't ever talk about here because there's no surveys done. But the percentage of young people in individual families in the Rock Church that stay living for God and understand what it means to live for God and have a walk with God is exceedingly high. I could start through here and give you whole families where all the children, two, three, four, five, all the children are living for God. And it's because that mothers and fathers have the revelation that I'm talking about here. It's because of the emphasis and the constant vigilance that goes along with uh, 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 the thing that destroys my kids is anything that puts in them a spirit that deviates from the things of God, the blessings of God, the ways of God, the joy of God, anything that brings seduction, anything that brings defiance, anything that brings... All of these things are things that I have got to avoid allowing my children to be exposed to because I don't want them to end up like Cain. Don't want them to end up like Cain. So, let's talk about June. June is my sister. Nelda June Pat. She was seven years, eight years older than me. She, um, my mother told me, received the Holy Ghost when she was probably 12, 13, which means I would have been three or four. And uh, for the next year or so, went to church of God, as a kid would do, child, young person. Then my dad, who lived for God, and my mother, who lived for God, My father, we lived in Visalia. My father was a game warden, and he took a job in Los Panas, right down the road here. But Los Panas did not have an apostolic church. I passed the road on I-5 yesterday that I used to live on when I was a little boy, Mercy Springs Road. If you drove I-5, you've seen Mercy Springs Road. And... When we moved there, I was maybe five or six, which means my sister now was about 14. And there was no apostolic church in Los Benes. But there was a good job. And, you know, a man has to work, you know. Man has to feed his family, you know. Well, and so he did. We lived in Los Panas for four years. We went to an Assembly God church. I'm not knocking, I'm just telling you, an Assembly God church has a lot of differences from an apostolic church. As young as I was, from five or six years old to ten years old, I can remember noticing the difference as a little boy, that this is different. I'm not kicking anybody under the bus. I'm just telling you the facts. It's different. And from an apostolic point, at least in that particular church, all local churches are different. But in that particular church, it was not a good difference. All the people were nice. In fact, they asked my father, who was quite a... Bible scholar, they said, Paul, would you, would you teach the adult Bible class? And as 
kindly as he could tell him. He said, no, no, I'll just come. And they pushed him. And finally he said, no, I won't teach it because I am apostolic. And I don't believe what you believe. And I don't want to get in a fight with you, but that's the bottom line. So he didn't teach it. But my sister was going to high school. And she made friends. And there wasn't no apostolic youth group. And there wasn't any Johannes Escudero. Oh, yeah. You may get twisted out of shape sometimes saying, well, I don't think the youth team does it right. I don't think this. I don't. You better just thank God there's a youth team. Because unless you've been there, you don't know what you're talking about. And unless you've been exposed to how vicious the forces are that destroy people, you can really make some serious mistakes. And so my father made one. I love my father. I'm just in retrospect. My father would tell you that if he was here. He's dead, but he would tell you that. He died in 1995. And those four years, from 14 to 18, while I was in uh, the town where she died this week, I looked at her old high school annuals, saw pictures I'd never seen, read notes from her old high school friends of things they did. And I said, Jesus, all of that in Los Banos where there was no apostolic church. But he made more money. He got a retirement out of it. About 1993, I said, Daddy, what would you do over if you had it to do over? He said, I'd spend more time talking to my kids. And I'd spend more time with them, trying to help them to see the things that really matter. But it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. So she got 18. We moved to Kerman, and she was there about a year. My dad and mom had certain rules in the house. She was 18. She got very angry. Hmm. There's that word again. Very angry at my father. He wouldn't give in to her. and There was a church there, but it was too late now. When she's 18, she left. She left mad, angry. Never to come back except once in a while to visit her mother. All my adult life until about 12, 14 years ago, Anytime we talk about my dad, she has a cussing fit. Angry. Angry. And then about 12 or 14 years ago, she shifted and said, you know, all these years I thought it was dad, but really it was mom. Angry. Angry. It really wasn't either one of them, female version of Cain. It was you. They made some mistakes and made you vulnerable. And you became possessed by some things until you were an angry person. And then after you were an angry person, you were self-willed and you were rebellious. And then you got exposed to some deep and evil forces. And then you became a spiritual wanderer and you lived a lifelong life of bitterness. And it got deeper and deeper deeper until finally her granddaughter calls and says uncle nate grandma's about to go that was like their mom the grandkids a boy and a girl are in their 20s they're estranged from their mom their mom acts like their grandma acted to everybody except the two grandkids better angry cussing, defiant, 
don't need anybody. Mad. Uncle Nate, I think Grandma's dying. Okay, I'll come. Well, Grandma said she didn't want you here or your brother here or anybody else here. I said, well, let me tell you something, honey. Your grandma don't tell me what to do. I'll be there. She may tell a lot of people what to do. But you make a mistake, friend, when you let a defiant, rebellious spirit control you. I don't care who it is. You have, to, you have to identify that spirit and you say, you may control everybody. And I'll be nice to you, but you're not going to control me. Not today. Not tomorrow. Not ever. Because I resist that. I am under the blood with the sheep. I'm not over here with the fruit people that eat the fruit of disobedience. So, Becca and I got on plane. Sheila came later. We flew. Got a car. Went there. On the way, her granddaughter calls me crying and said, Uncle Nate, she died. I said, well, we're on our way, baby. Just hang on. She said, do you want us to leave her here in the hospital or do you want us to have them come get her and take a funeral? I said, nope. Ask the hospital if they'll just leave her there. She said, well, Uncle Nate, she said she don't want no funeral. She don't want no memorial service. She wants to be cremated. I said, just leave her there till I get there. I'll be there in about an hour. We got there. Ended up to be about an hour and a half. We walked in. And her granddaughter, 24 years old, walked over to where I came in the door and said, Uncle Nate, after she died, my brother and I gave her a bath. And we ran home and got her best robe just for you and put it on her. And she said, come, see? I combed her hair. I put a little makeup on her face just for you. But she's dead. We talked a little bit, and she said, you know, Uncle Nate, did you ever notice that she never to come and visit any of the family? I said, I noticed that. She said, do you know why? I said, no. I said, I almost begged her to come to the church dedication in March. She said, Uncle Nate, she didn't come. Because she was embarrassed at how wrinkled her face was. And we walked over to the bed. And she said, rubber cheek right here, see how smooth it is? Uncle Nate, she just got a facelift six months ago. And she was just getting ready to visit all the family. She was waiting for the marks to go away. But she didn't make it. Always adamant about not weighing more than 130. And cussing at her kids if they weighed more. Always adamant about things that don't matter. I want to tell you, you are master of your fate and captain of your soul until your boat leaves finite life. And then if you don't have Jesus as your captain, you have sailed your boat off into what the Bible calls outer darkness. 
I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I don't care what you believe. I, that's not the point this morning. I don't care what I believe. I'm telling you what the Bible says. You have sailed your boat off into outer darkness. Where Jesus Christ said on more than one occasion, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Weeping, wailing. Now in the days of Jesus before his resurrection, there was a great gulf where they could see a cross and the righteous in paradise and those in hell could see each other. It's not that way anymore because when Jesus died, he had descended into the lower parts of the earth and he led captivity captive. Paradise is no longer in the same proximity. Paradise is now in heaven. And so here, what is outer darkness? If it was inner darkness, at least you could feel your way along the wall because inner implies it's circumstance. But outer darkness, like a planetary object, stumbling through space where the blackness is so great there is no sight whatever. Forever. And ever. I have had kids come through this church that have been raised under preaching that couldn't be any more biblical or anointed even before they got to this church. But somehow they never got it. I'm thinking of people in this church that are grown people. I don't know why they never got it. It breaks my heart they never got it. They come and sit on these pews, service after service after service. Some of you may be here today. I haven't, I haven't investigated to see if you're here. I hope you are. Service after service. Now, if you're an unbeliever and you're here and you don't believe there's a heaven or hell, don't worry about it, Frank. Just wait till you get there and find out. But if there's something in you that says, aha, he's talking to me. And if I was a parent, I wouldn't give up on my kid. I read Joni Larson's testimony last night. She said, my boy was raised in church long lineage of apostolics. When he was 13, she said he was so dedicated to God, I worried about him. He was just a fanatic. She said, I didn't stop him. She said, then when he got about 18, something happened. And she said, I got so mad at him when he started going with a sinner girl. And she said, I got so mad, I went to my office. And I got mad at the devil. And I really got mad at the girl because she said, I felt like she seduced him. And she said, day after day, I prayed and cried and screamed and wept. I said, God, how can this happen? He's a miracle child. We weren't even supposed to be able to have children. And now, we've done everything we know to do right. And the devil got him. God. And she said, then I would stop. And she said, I would get to my feet in my office and start shouting and praising and thanking God and praising him for every good thing there is about him. And she said, I'd do it when I was so sick, when I had no feeling at all. But I said, God, oh, God, oh, God. She said, sometime I would get so lost in praise that my family would call from home and say, where are you, Mom? It's nighttime. She said, I was so oblivious, so possessed with the spirit of Hannah. But like Hannah had a good spirit, she said, I didn't have a good spirit. And she said, so I made up my mind. I will start thanking God for them coming to church. And she said, after I'd done that for some time, they walked in the side door and sat down by me one night. She said, I was so grateful. But there was no response. 
Service after service, no response. She said, then one day I saw Vince raise his hand. She said, I saw him worship. And she said, but I just kept going to my office. And I kept rejoicing in the face of adversity. And I kept saying, God, not my boy. Not my boy. She said, then he prayed through. But his girlfriend didn't pray through. And she said, God, help me now. You're helping me to see that she's a soul. Help me now. She said, I started praying for her. I got a compassion for her. Finally, one day I saw a tear come out of her eye in church. And she said, that was all. Weeks went by until finally I saw her lift her hands and receive the Holy Ghost. Get baptized in Jesus' name. Both of them now full-time in the work of God. You can't give up. There's people in this church that I've been working on for years. Some of them, if you ask them, you'd think they hate my guts. But I know they got nowhere to go. As long as I can until they become so intolerable or so problematic or so contagious that we have to ask them to leave. Until then, we will frantically keep Code Blue going, doing our best. Because when you get away from God, friend, there's nothing left. It's all over. If I had a rebellious streak in me today, she died a defiant, bitter old woman. When I invited her to the dedication, my sister-in-law told me in front of my brother, Ah, you know, I know those Pentecostals. They're just a bunch of gossiping people. When my sister-in-law told me that, I said, What did she say? Because I want to tell you something, friend. When it comes to things of God, I'm not taking no guff from nobody. They can kill me if they want to. But I know what I got. And I know how good God is. And I know how good God's people are. And I know how much they love God and love other people. She said, she said, just a bunch of gospel people. I said, what did she say? She looked puzzled. She said, just a bunch of gospel people. I said, who said it? She said, your sister. I said, who'd she say it to? She said, me. What did she say? She told me again, I said, what do you think she was doing when she told you that? She had a little problem getting it. My brother put his beer can down. He said, what he's trying to tell you is you're the ones that's doing the gossiping. That's right. But you get so entangled in it until you're convinced that you're right and everybody's wrong. And you have become an incorrigible rebel. Virtually untouchable in some cases. And after all these years, I'm still preaching to some of you. Shall we stand? Teresa Baker is one of the best little old Christians I know. Her sister died last year. Cancer. Her sister knew the Lord. They went through all the stuff that cancer patients go through. The whys, the wherefores. Am I mad at God? Am I not mad at God? Teresa said, I had a dream. She said, when we were little girls, 
She said I was always the shortest in the family. She's only about four foot ten. She said I was always the shortest in the family. But we had to cross a little bridge over a railroad track. And one time when we were real small, a train went under that while we were on the bridge. And it terrified my sister. She said every time we crossed that bridge, she would cry and say, no, 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 on the way to school. And she said I would pick her up. But because she was taller, her feet would drag on the bridge. And I would drag her across the bridge with her yelling, no, no, no. She said, when my sister was dying, God gave me a vision of those days. She said, when I woke up, I knew God had spoke to me and said, carry your sister the rest of the way. She said, so I got with my sister. She said, my sister looked at me and said, well, Teresa, the way I look at it is, it's a win-win for me. If God heals me, I stay here. And I live for him, and I've got the Holy Ghost, and I'll do his will, and that's a win. But if God doesn't heal me, and I die, I am going to be with him. I don't doubt it. I know I am, because I got the Holy Ghost, and that's a win. It's a win-win. And she said, she closed her eyes. She quit breathing, and Roland said, she's gone. She said, my mother started speaking in tongues, in the most clear, articulate tongues, over the bed, speaking in tongues. Went on for two or three minutes, and she said, one of the kids said, look, Sissy's open her eyes. Sissy's saying something. And she said, my sister opened her eyes and said something. She said, I couldn't tell what she said. And then died in complete peace. I looked at that ravaged old body. The daughter and the two grandkids had a screaming, cussing fit at least three or four times over her body while she was dying. Yelling, screaming. I mean, those people know how to cuss. They don't know how to pray. But they know how to cuss. And the spirit of bitterness. I don't want you to think I'm over exaggerating, but the demonic bondage of bitterness that held Grandma created chaos over her dying body with the bitterness transferred to her daughter. And now the bitterness transferred to her grandkids. Did she want it that way? Uh -uh. But like produces like. When you start down the way of Cain, man or woman, you get so far until you cross some kind of line and you can't, and you can't get back. And you slip on off. You slip on off. That's why I love you, Brother Phillips. We talked about it again this morning, he and I. He said, I let it get me. Something was wrong. I let it get me for years. And he said, it wasn't easy. But I made it back. And I'm here. And I got the Holy Ghost. What about you? Most of them never make it back. This morning, if I had 
any sin in my life, if I was hiding anything, I would be so afraid to walk out these doors. If I was one of these people that had that defiant spirit of bitterness, everybody's bad, acrimony rules, accusative, cynical, harsh. Oh yeah, you may weigh at 130. What's it matter how much a corpse weighs? Let's sing. I surrender all. So I'm living for God today. I also got the Holy Ghost when I was about 13 or 14. But when my daddy said, don't do that, son, I said, all right, dad. I'll obey. When my mother said, don't do that, son, I said, all right. In fact, I got so much of Jesus that they didn't have to tell me very much because I found a real Savior. And I fell so in love with him. The greatest thing in my church, in my life then and now, was going to church with God's people, feeling the Holy Ghost, knowing Jesus. Friend, you don't have to worry about me finding anything better. I'm like a lot of other folks here. We've already seen all that other stuff. That's why we're here. Not interested in going there. If that's what you want, I feel sorry for you. I don't want to go there. I want to be as close to Jesus as I can get. I'm not trying to run on the edge and hope I'm saved. I love Jesus. I want, to, I want more of Jesus. I want to walk with Jesus every day. I don't feel bad about having to live for Jesus. He's the sweetest thing that ever happened. He's the lover of my soul. I wouldn't change him for a thousand worlds like this one. I don't want anything this nasty, unclean, filthy world or the dirty devil has. I'm happy. I'm happy that I know him. I want to bow at his feet. Oh, no, I want to kneel. I'll only be a whole man when I do kneel. I'll never be a whole man in defiance. I'll only be a whole man when I kneel at the foot of the cross and let Jesus make me whole with the healing of my spirit bringing me to him to know his glory and know his power and know his spirit